Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. We've done 570 something of them now. Um, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu where you'll find all the previous ones archived in different ways. Um, this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there is a uh, PayPal button on every page of the website. And also um, there's a page that explains other ways of supporting it if you don't like to use PayPal. My guest today is Asil Toksal. Welcome, Asil. Hi, Rick. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Actually, we've, we've met. <laughs> Asil and I have been chatting for 20 minutes, getting things set up here. And um, I, am, I immediately felt a, a nice um, affinity or, I don't know, familiarity with him. You know, you feel that with some people. You meet them and you feel like, okay, I know this guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Asil is an Austrian-born channel. He's much more than a channel, but he, he, he channels, as you'll see. Um, his work includes group energy alignment sessions and the channeling of celestial guides, as well as working on the energetic alignment of sacred sites around the world. We're going to talk about that. Um, the goal of this work is to assist in the evolution of consciousness in humanity. He has traveled widely to do this throughout the U.S., Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, for the past 18 years, a seal has been deeply committed to a spiritual path, while also training in a variety of different energy healing modalities. He has worked with many masters and lineage holders of various traditions in South America, North America, and China. In his earlier years, he also served as a CEO and corporate executive in software marketing and communications. Um, all right, I could read the rest of this bio, but I think I'll just switch to having a seal tell us this in his own words. So um, I've read most of your book, a seal. Um, I would have read all of it, but I ran out of time, but I read at least three quarters of it. And I particularly enjoyed um, the beginning part where you told your personal story of how you had been a good student and all that and, and become quite a successful businessman, but then felt dissatisfaction and started looking for something deeper. So I think it'd be nice if, if you were to tell us that story um, in as much detail as you like, um, and we'll take it from there. Great. Well, thanks for reading the book. Oh, yeah, it was good. <laughs> it is always um, an interesting journey to be vulnerable and transparent about one's life or journey to the general public. <laughs> um, so just to give you a little bit of a background, um, I was born in Austria uh, to a family um, of immigrants from Turkey. So my parents had moved in their early 20s. And so me and my sister were born into a family that uh, was looking for a better future um, in a more developed country, in, you know, bigger economic outlook. So my parents' focus was very much what they couldn't have, their unfulfilled dreams. And that was an excellent academic education and economic career that would allow for stability and a great outlook for the future. So me and my sister became these um, academic monsters. <laughs> <laughs> so we studied multiple different um, uh, majors and different universities. Uh, my sister is even uh, like she speaks like eight languages and so on. Like I, I went more like the engineer and scientist route. I became a chemical engineer and computer scientist. And we were doing everything right by the book. We were excelling in what the unfulfilled dreams of our parents was. And I was following a path that I was attracted to, but didn't really know until much later um, what I was really wanting from life. So I thought, this is what I want from life. It's because my parents want this for me or society wants this for me. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. A lot of people do that. 
So um, early on, even before I finished my studies, um, I had this idea that, wow, that was 20 years ago. The world is crumbling. The way the earth is being treated, the way we use energy is so inefficient and is so unsustainable. I'm going to look into what are other energy methods to get into that. So I started a biofuels uh, investigation, search, research, and then eventually a biofuels company to, to create fuels out of waste, waste oils. And that worked. I was an early 20-year-old uh, and raised money and built that company. It was almost like a dream was manifesting itself in front of me. My dream of making the world a better place with engineering, went with science and with entrepreneurship. And I followed that dream for a while and I started to see that a dream and its manifestation is not enough. There was something intrinsically embedded in the fabric of society that prevented um, the creations of this kind to fully have an impact on society and the world. That was competition from uh, industry peers that have the same vision of making the world a better place, but there was like this gnarly old tycoon-like competition. Mm. <laughs> so I got this And then competition from through. companies that don't give a damn about making the world a better place. They just want to make a lot of money. And so they're pushing yes. the old technologies. Yes. And they are pushed by the financial economic systems as well, right? right. Extraction and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, optimization and, and stock markets and shareholders. So there is like a whole other system that's pushing them. Yeah. So it's like trickles down all the way to the consumer. Mm -hmm. So we are in this giant system. <laughs> Good luck trying to break it from all the way down, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like you need multiple entry points. So uh, as a blue-eyed 21, 22-year-old, um, I decided to sell my shares in the company and leave the company, even though it was a working um, creation. And I thought, this is interesting. I have now exited a company that I've created, and I have achieved, quote-unquote, what my parents wanted me to achieve. It was some level of success. Um, it was um, a recognition from my peers. It was recognition, some form of, you know, fame, 15 minutes of fame or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> right, Marshall McLuhan. And here I am sitting in my room, uh, in, in my living room, in my nice apartment in Vienna after a party that I had hosted and I felt so empty. There was a part of me that just felt like, this is not it. Whatever this is, it's not it. And this emptiness was so strong and I didn't have any more 12 and 14 hour days of working. So I didn't have the distractions to distract me from this big, gaping hole in my heart and i thought this is what i need to find this is what i need to look for it's no longer doing 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 action 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 no matter how well intended it is it is more like looking something inside of me needs to be observed and to be discovered more closely that started the whole journey <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, I kind of came to a similar res realization when I was that age, um, but my life was a shambles. I didn't have anything to really renounce <laughs> in order to devote myself to uh, consciousness, but I did realize that consciousness is the ultimate sort of uh, fulcrum or lever, you know, which is the most influential level. If we can somehow function at that level, we can change all the more manifest levels that are built upon it. And uh, I still feel that, um, you know, I mean, 
everything we see going on in the world with climate change and everything else is really just a symptomatic of some deeper me- dynamics in human consciousness or human psychology. And if we really want to change all this, all these symptoms, we've got to get to the underlying cause. And so I, I commend you for coming to that realization as young as you did and, to, and for doing something about it. Let's say I had a trigger to look deeper, Uh, the actual realization that uh, consciousness evolution is really the the key to all of our evolution as a species, as a society, as a civilization, uh, came much later. When I started to find liberation, um, some form of growth um, and freedom from continuously doing my internal work, so to say, internal work as in healing, realignment, relationships, and all of that, really finding what had been disconnected within me. I started to realize, wow, if everyone would operate from a more liberated and more aligned place inside, we would have a completely different world. Yeah. I interviewed a school teacher about a month ago, and... um... She had had a near-death experience and some very profound insights, but she was describing, you know, what she encounters as a school teacher, and, you know, in in where she lived anyway, in a rather poorer section of Dallas, um, all the kids are strung out on drugs. Many of them during class, you know, they're they're totally stoned. There's they're all the, the girls are getting pregnant. The the guys are getting in trouble with the law, and it, it's kind of like. You know, I, I multiply that times all the cities in, around the country. And wow, if this is the foundation, if this is the next generation coming up, and obviously not all the kids are this way, but it, it's really uh, quite a, kind of a hidden pandemic of confused, unhappy, lost people. How can we expect society to flourish, you know, if that's the foundation? Um, you know, we, it, it's possible to have it so different than that but we are not there yet <laughs> by a long shot in terms of creating that kind of the kind of education where kids could really um, start on, on the path to spiritual awakening at a, at a young age and, and, you know, reach their full potential as adults. Mm. Yeah, it's an excellent point that you make. And an additional thing that I'm observing is that also the, The newest generations that I'm, aside from the generations that are already being indoctrinated with existing educational systems, indoctrinated with like old beliefs and old mechanisms, infrastructures, mental infrastructures, emotional infrastructures of the past generations, including the wounds that haven't been healed yet and processed, right? There is an entirely new generation that's coming that feels... I don't know, like I have conversations with a four-year-old or a five-year-old. Yeah. I'm just mind blown. Yeah. Thinking like I'm talking to like a, an ancient Taoist master here. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it is mind blowing the type of souls that are entering this plane. Yeah. Now that's, I'm glad you said that because I, I, you know, you needed to counterbalance the point I just made, which seemed rather depressing. Um, so, I mean, what do you think? There's two questions here. What is it? There, uh, on the one hand, there's this tremendous confusion and, uh, and suffering and, and, you know, people going through all kinds of messed up stuff. And on the other hand, there's some really bright souls coming in. Um, so what do you make of that dichotomy? Well, uh, I call it the great polarity. Uh-huh. <laughs> and In this uh, incredible time of awakening, incredible time of transition or transformation, we have to go through a really intense polarity, a polarity within us as well as a polarity within society. And this polarity pulls to the extremes of our consciousness, to the extremes of our emotions. And that is represented as well in the people, as well as the perspectives that we hold, the full spectrum, right, on its edges. And 
I think this intense polarity is required to come to a place of unification eventually. It's almost like consciousness, it's stretching itself to really see all perspectives from all angles as wide as possible before it can unify in a grander perspective. Huh. That's the way I've been envisioning it. I think you have something there. I, I think there are historical precedents for this too, going back even thousands of years, the, the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata starts with this whole huge polarity that had built up in that society, and then it culminated in this great war. But um, I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, and I mean, I'm, I actually took some notes here yesterday that I wanted to ask you about in terms of this polarity point. Um, there's political polarities that are, that are really extreme now and, and social unrest, uh, you know, and that's very polarized. And there's even polarization with regard to the, the COVID pandemic, you know. Um, one whole segment of the population thinks it's a hoax or nothing to worry about. The other, another is taking it seriously. Or climate change, again. Um, and it tends to be along political lines, but one whole sec section of society, you know, thinks it's, a, again, a hoax. And another is, you know, it's a dire problem. And then there are all these conspiracy theories flying around that confuse the heck out of everybody because you can't tell what's true these days. Anybody can say anything on the internet and people tend to be very impressionable or gullible when they, they hear something, they, it, it seems to ring true and then they, they adapt their, their way of thinking to that thing, even though it might be completely untethered from any kind of reality. So, so again, I'll have you comment on that a little bit. Mm. Well, I've come to, you know, coming from the background that I'm coming from, you know, as, a, uh, as an Austrian with an engineering and scientific background, I held a very tight and narrow perspective of what truth and what reality is, right? And just having gone the spiritual journey, I had to hold both a really wide spectrum of perspectives that are possible and that are true to the person that is experiencing that reality and seeing it from their perspective, as well as my perspective also being true. Almost like holding a paradox in your hand by truly being present, not just as an individual, but as a consciousness. Does that make sense? It does. And actually, it reminds me of a, a quote from uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj, if you've heard of him, an Indian sage. He, he said that the ability to appreciate paradox and ambiguity is an indicator of, of one's level of spiritual maturity. Hmm. Yeah. I'll say thank you to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, it, indeed, I mean, many of the things that you experience that, and that we're going to talk about today would seem completely outlandish to the average person. They think, well, this absolutely. guy's nuts. You know, he, he can't be experiencing all that stuff. Um, and so, and yet I believe you are, and you, you believe you are. And, uh, and, you know, and, and I, you know, I believe in all kinds of things that are, pretty far out by ordinary standards and that the, the general public wouldn't accept. And yet the general public is also accepting all kinds of things that I think are pretty outlandish um, mm -hmm. and that are mistaken and that aren't based on a scientific uh, approach. Right. So there is all these different perspectives and, and I don't necessarily like, I do appreciate science. I do you know, coming from that background. And I also believe that science 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago looked very, very different. Oh, yeah. right? The things that were not accepted to be true and the things that were accepted to be true is wide from, like far away from where we are today. Yeah. And it will be very, very different in 10 years from now, what we perceive to be true and not to be true. And, you know, dwelling a little bit into the, you know, some of the scientists that have been on the edge of consciousness, like they come to a place where they're like, okay, at this point, there's like no answers really. I think this is kind of like going into the belief realm or into the God realm. And there is um, 
a fascination that I have when a scientist reaches that part, yeah. that limb, that edge. Yeah, good point. I mean, modern science predominantly has a materialist reductionist emphasis these days. So that's their paradigm. And anybody talking about, you know, consciousness or near-death experiences or the channeling or um, angels or any of that stuff doesn't fit into that paradigm and is rejected as being, you know, preposterous or hallucinatory or something. Um, but the materialist paradigm has been woefully inadequate to, you know, it's, it's built us rockets to get to the moon and bridges and skyscrapers, but then, you know, the, the, we're on the verge of climate extinction and, and all kinds of other problems. So obviously it's a very mixed blessing. And, um, and I think you would agree that perhaps, uh, you know, we don't need to dismantle it. We need to supplement it with an understanding of its foundation in consciousness we need to flip the whole thing on its head rather than consciousness being a product of the brain. The brain and everything else is a manifestation of consciousness. And then it'll all kind of start to work out. Mm -hmm. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think it's a, it's a complementary. It's almost like infusing these, um, the edges of consciousness with outrageous ideas, with um, the imagination with which humanity has started science in the first place. Yeah, a oh, good point. And it's actually by outrageous ideas that science has ever advanced. I mean, when, when Einstein first came out with his theories of relativity, people, people were saying, how did he come up with that? You know, that is so out of the box. And yet the equations supported it, you know? <laughs> exactly. Well, let's get back to your story. We've gone off on yes. a little bit of a tangent. And um, yes. people want to know, you know, like, who you are and how, how you got to thinking the way you think. So... We last left you um, at, at some kind of party, <laughs> where yeah. you and uh, you hadn't really started out on your spiritual journey. And yeah. uh, let's let's talk about how that proceeded. So the spiritual journey was a parallel track to continuing my worldly journey. I continued to build companies and run companies, software and marketing. And I uh, moved to the United States. I saw a greater vision for myself in the United States. And in the United States, I became much more acquainted with the native uh, American traditions. Um, anything from sweat lodges to, you know, rituals that I could join, participate, come closer to uh, spirit. Because I, I felt there was something there that I couldn't understand and society didn't really have answers for me. So I wanted to meet the people that were really close to spirit. They were close to something mystical, the mystery of life, the mystery of existence. That I hadn't found answers yet from science <laughs> in my regard or from society. And so that was a first step in and eventually I started to... Uh, dwell into Chinese mysticism, Taoist mysticism, and started to study with a Taoist master in China. And that took me on an entire new understanding of, wow, the Taoist approach to spiritual development is actually incredibly scientific. And the ancient Taoists were mathematicians, astronomers. They were uh, healers like you know, the way traditional Chinese medicine had been developed or the I Ching had been developed, it's so incredibly precise and detailed, right? It's not like super mystical. They took the mystical and tried to make it into a tangible, reproducible and sustainable method of understanding reality. So I was super fascinated by that, of course, the scientist and the engineer in me, right? And learning different methods of meditation as well as internal energy management and understanding the way energy moves in nature and the way energy moves inside of the body and if you do certain practices in a certain way for a certain amount of time you will get results like that was their promise they would say if you do a b and c you will get to d yeah, yeah. and like okay this sounds great like let me do it so I followed that path for a while, and, and then I got a little impatient. I got a little impatient because then 
you know, the master would say, here, you need to do this particular meditation for seven years. Come back to me when you're done with it. And I was like, what? Seven years? We don't have that time. We don't have that time. And so, um, you know, the curious, the impatient, and the, um, the researcher in me continued the journey. So I spent some time in India. I spent some time in South America, really finding more people that are close to spirit. How do they get to spirit? And what do they do when they get to spirit? How does it shape their perspective of the world? And are they truly better people and human beings as a result of that? Mm. That's an important thing. That was for me an in important indicator. It's like, I didn't care how spiritually evolved someone was. If they couldn't be a good and decent human being that delivered a positive outcome on their lives and on the lives of others. Yeah, you should know them by their fruits. That's exactly right. And so I spent, you know, a good amount of time with shamans of uh, South America and different tribes and also in the jungle, in the mountains of uh, Peru, as well as uh, in the mountains of uh, India. And doing, just, some, uh, doing some ayahuasca in there, it sounds like, Peru. Literally uh, all medicines you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, various types of uh, dietas and various types of rituals. And similarly as well in India and um, other parts of Southeast Asia. For me, what was important is there is an access into the non-material world. There is an access to consciousness as well as altered states of consciousness that each civilization or different versions of civilizations on societies have developed entry points into, right? Imagine it to be like a mountain where there's many, many different paths up the mountain. Right. Right. And in some ways, they're all right. Like you can't say one is right and the other one isn't. They all have different pathways. Some pathways are a little bit, you know, like more scenic and some pathways are more direct and super intense. Right. And some pathways are sustainable. Some pathways you make three steps forward, two steps back. Right. <laughs> so I was just mesmerized by the idea how humanity has established itself or the consciousness of humanity is desiring to go up a mountain. They don't really fully understand why, but it's like intrinsically in us. Yeah. You know, as you were saying that, I kept thinking, you know, it's, isn't it cool? Isn't it interesting how we all have this kind of innate knowing that there is some higher dimension, something to be realized. And we may not know what it is, but there's this sort of natural human craving to find it. I'm reminded of the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where Richard Dreyfuss, you know, kept looking for, he knows there's something. You've seen that movie? Yeah. Yeah. He's messing with the, he's building a mountain of mashed potatoes on his plate at the dinner table. And he said, this means something. I know this means something. His family's looking at him like he's crazy. <laughs> but, um, and he couldn't stop. You know, that movie is a beautiful metaphor for the spiritual path. You know, everyone was trying to tell him he was crazy and he should give it up and, you know, keep working for the telephone company. And he kept thinking, no, I've got to find this thing. I know it's there. I don't know what it is. And, you know, he eventually finds it. But, um, you know, we're, I think all of humanity is driven by an urge like that. Yeah. And that was the urge that was driving me. Yeah. Um, I, I knew there's something there. There's something deeper, in, a deeper calling inside. And I really needed to find out what it was. Um, so... Basically, all the different healing methodologies that I had experienced on myself that delivered some form of opening, some form of um, expansion, I thought, wow, this is really good. And I started to tell people about it. I said, like, hey, try this. Like, it will make you better. I could see how some people were just stuck in their lives running the hamster wheel the way I had been doing it. So I said, hey, just at least try a couple of different things. Here's like 15 different things you could try. And so I would 
start to infuse that in the communities around me and the people in my relationships. And eventually I started to see, oh, wow, I could actually learn to do some of these things myself, given time and practice and training. And I started to do that. I started to hold retreats that would allow individuals to come um, to a deep, deeper level of sense, to with some of the pains that had been suppressed, some of the wounds that had not been processed properly, where the space wasn't there to process it. Because in society, we keep on running and the symptoms are treated, but then you treat it enough, you can go back into the machine and to continue running in the machine, right? So I was like, okay, a lot of people just don't have the space for the healing that is required to happen. And I was given that space by some of the people that I went to, but not everyone can go that extreme. So that was somehow my process. And I started, I left again, you know, the companies that I had created and went back into that space and said, okay, you know what? I will dedicate my entire life to this journey, to the journey of healing and evolution and growth, whatever that looks like. And so once, I'm, once I was in that journey, I was doing retreats all around the world. And there was particularly one retreat that I had held in, uh, interesting enough, in Northern California, in the Redwood Forest. And it was a full moon night with, you know, the misty fog going through the Redwood Forest. We're sitting outside by the fire and the retreat has just finished. And I told everyone, you know, they, just, they can just go to bed. And I'm there sitting in the forest, still in deep meditation. And all I could hear was suddenly the silencing of the birds and the insects. Everything turned really quiet, almost like a soundproof dome of energy just was like, covering me and the entire space. And I could feel the presence of something else. Like there was a reverence to the energy that had just shifted. And I thought, wow, this is either jackpot or I'm in trouble. <laughs> like one of the two. <laughs> and so, and these lights that were around me, these light beings, um, I felt some sort of intelligence, some sort of consciousness that was with me. And they started to speak to me in a way that I thought it's just like you and I speaking. I thought maybe it's a part of my consciousness that's speaking to me. It's a higher part of me. And the voice said, you're finally ready and we can now work with you. I thought, okay, um, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> and just, and, just uh, to yeah. clarify a little bit, so was that like just a subtle thought in your mind or, or was it um, kind of like clear as a bell as if someone were there with you in the forest speaking this to you? I mean, how concrete or was that voice? It was, it was you know, with closed eyes. It was feeling like an incredibly vivid vision while in half asleep, half awake state. I was awake, I was sitting and it just was, I was overwhelmed by the energy of that vision. It just didn't come just as a vision and words, but there was an energy about it as well. Yeah, yeah. And it was not subtle, like it was visceral. <laughs> so, I thought, okay, uh, something's going on here. A uh, part of me was terrified. A part of me was excited. And I said, who is this? And who is speaking? And the first voice said, my name is Emmanuel, and I will be guiding you through this process. And I thought, who is Emmanuel? I don't even know who or what Emmanuel is. I thought maybe it sounds like maybe a saint, you know, like a, Maybe it's the past on ghost spirit of a saint. The next day I Googled Emmanuel <laughs> and it turns out it's an angelic being. 
And I thought, okay, now I must be really losing my mind. Um, I can't talk to anyone about this. This is just way too out there. Like angels are talking to me, kind of, you know, angels to me are, you know, were creations of myths and legends, stories that people could hold on to in difficult times. That's what I believed it to be, a creation to help human humans or humanity through difficult times. Right? It's a beautiful purpose. That's what I thought it to be. And here it is, a light being announcing itself with its name and talking to me. Maybe angels were a real thing. But I kept silent. I didn't talk to anyone about it. <laughs> I kept it for myself. And the thing is, they kept on coming back. There was a consistency that built trust, that built confidence. You know, in science, it only makes things start to make sense when they're repeatable, <laughs> when they're consistent. You're like, okay, something is here. Something is going on. I don't necessarily fully understand what it is, but something is going on that is reproducible. And, and they said, we will make adjustments to your physical body, to your energetic body, to your emotional body, and to your mental body. And these adjustments will eventually make you a vessel through which we can work. And the work that you will do, if you choose so, <laughs> is working with people, humanity, working with the individuals that have an improportionate amount of leverage and influence on society, as well as with specific places around the world that carry important energetic signature, energetic relevance to humanity's consciousness. Sacred sites, places of importance or places of trauma. So I said, okay, let's... Uh, Let's explore what that looks like. So I put my entire life on pause for about a year and a half where I was being worked on every day for multiple hours. And being worked on looked fairly intense. Um, it was a change in diet. It was a change in exercise. It was a change in sleeping patterns. Uh, it was hours and hours of meditation and really energy surges moving through my body and I was flapping on the ground. You know, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Is this really progress? Is this what progress looks like? <laughs> Am I becoming a beached whale? <laughs> exactly. And it looked a bit like I was having epileptic seizures. Yeah, creates. And I was at times, I was really concerned as well for myself. I thought, well, what if this is some sort of, you know, mental illness that I'm trying to make sense of, and therefore I've created a whole story in my mind of what this mental illness is, <laughs> right? And so I went through that route a little bit. I talked to a couple of people that were actually professionals, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists, and they said, they asked me a couple of, you know, evaluating questions, and they said, it doesn't look like you are you know, mentally ill, like there's something happening to you and you're grounded, you're still rational, you're functional, um, and it doesn't seem to be negatively impacting your life. So like, we can't really help you. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, you must've uh, done a little Googling and, and seen that people do have these movements and when there's some Kundalini awakening. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So I started to see parallels in Kundalini. I started to see that my body would go like into specific spontaneous mudras and I would be stuck in these mudras and like these electric surges would go through my body. I was like in catharsis in a mudra. And I thought I never learned mudras really. And I didn't really know what they meant. I thought, you do the mudra and then you get something, but this was more like intrinsic. The mudra was doing itself. And so it kept on going until I had another, a new being that came in 
And I have to tell you like what it felt like when they enter my body or when they connect with me. It's like that scene in the matrix when Neo is plugged into the matrix and he is like the surge and suddenly, you know, it's like this really intense uh, experience for him. And then suddenly he's in the matrix. Right. It's the way it would feel like. Mm. So I was entering a different matrix, almost like I was entering a different space of consciousness. And in that space of consciousness, I would have communication with these beings that humanity has categorized as angelic or archangelic beings. They don't call themselves angels or archangels. They just are. And they say, we're choosing the names that humanity has given us. And in the context and frame that you come from, these are the names that you will understand. They've had different names in other civilizations, which is really fascinating to me. There's like a recurring pattern of their involvement and their interventions in society. So I thought, okay, this is getting really interesting, right? This is getting super fascinating. And it was Raphael that connected with me about six months into this process and said, I will continue the work. And then eventually you, we will tell you when you're ready to serve individuals and other beings, other humans. And that was about a year and a half in when I started to do sessions uh, with people where I would be embodied. And this is, you will see that when we start to do the channeling, like my body will go through an energy buildup until my vessel is ready. They will then embody. There is, it's almost like my body falls, uh, you know, like flattens down. And then suddenly it's like erected because there is this connection that happens. And then this, this outside consciousness is then suddenly embodying and using my arms to do what it needs to do and speaking through me. My consciousness is we here, like I'm a bit further distanced. I'm observing what is happening through me. And it is a strange uh, experience because I'm um, a very cerebral person. And so it took me a long time to give up control over this vessel because I, I, I identified so strongly with this mind and with this body and like, oh my God, something else is going to be using this, steering this. Who am I? Am I going to get lost in the process? <laughs> and so on. Do you feel like, well, it's going on. If you really wanted to, you could just say, all right, I've had enough, get up and do something else. Uh, you're, you're not completely under. Correct. Yeah. Right. So this is what in, in uh, terminology, we differentiate between an embodiment and the possession. An embodiment is an agreement where the host, they call me the host, <laughs> the host can say, okay, thank you very much, I've had enough, or today I'm not going to work, or whatever it is. I can interrupt the connection and they will leave voluntarily. Mm -hmm. The a possession is different. Right, it's, you don't even know you're possessed, right? You're just gone. Yeah, or you don't have any control over it. Right. You have the ability to interfere or break it. Would it be safe to say that um, higher beings wouldn't do a possession like that? That would be some lower being. Higher beings have more respect for your autonomy. Absolutely. So there is something that I consider the spiritual autonomy and the spiritual sovereignty of an individual human being. There is a tremendous respect and this is one of the first laws of human existence is the free will and the autonomy of a human being. That is not violated by beings of uh, higher consciousness. They have respect for that because it is, um, it is part of the human construct. Yeah, and they have higher consciousness, so it's, which would mean that they're serving a higher purpose they're serving the good you know they're not some kind of nefarious character that's just out for some kind of entertainment or some sort of uh, you know 
lower gratification. Yeah, and I will say that in this spectrum of like higher beings and really what we consider, you know, bad or evil or whatever it is, there is a spectrum, a really, really wide spectrum of 50,000 shades of gray. (laughs) (laughs) So there is so much in the middle that we don't fully understand. We try to judge it. We try to evaluate it. And this is where a lot of, um, you know, mystical people dwell in, like in the many, many shades that are between the very, very high consciousness and the very, very low consciousness. Yeah. And there's a lesson in that, uh, which is to say that um, just, you know, I mean, we know that certain truths are hidden and all of spirituality is about discovering something that's ordinarily hidden. But that is not to say that all hidden things are worth discovering or are or contain truth or goodness. <laughs> That is, um, I'll say that is to be determined, right? (laughs) And there is a curiosity about human nature that will just drive us to look for these things, no matter what. You know, you can tell a child not to touch the fire, but eventually, possibly, it will start, it will touch it, you know, it will get burned and it will have to learn sometimes by hard way personal visceral experience yeah there's a good guiding principle though which we could say is highest first you know yeah i mean we have only so much time in life and there are so many things potentially to be explored so why not you know put your bucket list start it with the the things that are really worthwhile (laughs) so this uh journey has been taking me on an incredible ride and uh you know, from healings uh, to sacred sites to, um, you know, events like mass gatherings where spiritual transformation was in the air with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And the transformation that I'm being a witness to, like I'm, I don't take credit for it. I'm like, okay, well, I take credit for the work that I've done to be a vessel, but the work is definitely being done by something, a much higher intelligence, which is incredibly generous and incredibly loving and incredibly unconditionally giving at a time where we need support. (laughs) Yeah, there's an interesting point there. In your book, I quoted the following line, following our agreement... We have returned to intervene in human evolution once more and for the last time. And so, I mean, the first part of that implies that there are, there are some ascended masters or higher beings or whatever you want to call them that um, are concerned with humanity and that, are, that have our best interests in mind and that are doing what they can to help us along. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of traditions allude to that kind of thing. Um, but it's interesting to, to to really consider it and take it seriously. And then this thing about once more and for the last time, what are they saying there? I mean, hasn't this been going on for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps? Yeah, so, okay, a couple of the things that I'm going to say now might be a little controversial. And, you know, just, uh, you know, everyone take it uh, and, and leave what you can't take. <laughs> take what you need and you leave the rest. Um, the guides that I've been in communication with and the information that I've been getting suggests that humanity was established um, by creation, by design, by higher consciousness. That um, humanity itself was an experiment of multiple cycles, of multiple iterations, and we are currently the iteration that has come the furthest in its consciousness evolution. Hmm. Not were, this, just were the other iterations here on Earth, or you mean on other planets or something? Um, or both? Definitely here on Earth, mm-hmm. and possibly on other planets as well. Hmm. And so, so other ones maybe fizzled out or self-destructed or something, but we've yeah. made it a little farther than those. Correct. Okay. And we're coming to a place of spiritual ripening. Like whatever that means, right? So 
the way I understand it is this, this earth is the home that we know. And we believe this is the only home that we can have. Right? And there is the perspective that is being shared, which is earth is a learning process. It's a learning stage. It's a type of school, if you want to say so, for consciousness to come to a certain level of understanding, to a certain level of realization. That's the word that they use. And the realization that consciousness gets to is connected to the realizations that the individuals get to. So every single individual is going through a self-realization process. And through that, all of human consciousness grows. And they're saying that there is indeed something like an expiration date on humanity's existence on this planet, which is independent of our uh, inability to live sustainably on this planet. So that's that's a separate path, right? Um, our self-destructive nature is due to our experimentations and our unconscious behaviors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So are you saying that even if we learn to live sustainably, there will still be an expiration date? That is what I'm saying. Okay. Please elaborate. Um, so it's interesting. I had a long time of like resistance to it and a long time of not speaking about it publicly because I don't want to be a doomsday proponent. You know, I, it's not necessarily like... Uh, as a scientist, what I believe in. And it was really hard for me to fully embrace until I started to get the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that we as a consciousness, um, there is a next step. There's a next evolution. We're moving from high school to university. That is a different place. That is a different form and shape of existence, a different format of learning a different format of experiencing. And that is not in material form. So there is non-material forms of existence that have moved from the material form to non-material forms of existence. And we are in this process of moving in that direction. Yeah, but there's always a spectrum, as you say. And even the, the uh, beings that you've been communicating with were once humans, uh, at least for some of their lifetimes, and yet now they don't need to be, or it's they can serve a better purpose not being in f human form. Um, but even if, let's say, 10 or 20 or 50% of humanity reaches that stage at which they no longer need to be materially embodied, um, wouldn't there still be many other souls that haven't reached that stage that would find it rather convenient to have a planet to live on in order to continue to uh, evolve? So that's the fascinating part about human, the human experience. The human experience is a combination of there is a human consciousness itself, which is a collective consciousness. And then there is soul containers that derive from different parts of consciousness, different parts of existence, different civilizations almost. They're having a human experience embodying human consciousness and the human body. In this embodiment, the soul container, the human consciousness as a collective, as well as all of consciousness is having a learning experience. It's a win-win-win situation, right? So everyone is evolving through this human experience. Yeah, individually and collectively. Correct, individually right. and collectively. So once this iteration of human consciousness finalizes, there will be other iterations of either humanoid type or of a different type where soul containers can still have an experience, an embodied experience, a material experience. So their, their evolution will continue. Right. Uh, so... <laughs> Here's a quote from your book that relates to that container thing. Um, beyond all those parts of yourself that you can observe, feel, and understand, 
there is a part of you that is beyond comprehension. That is the majority of your being. So in other words, you know, what we think we are is just one tiny little tip, like a fingertip of a much greater body. I think that Dalai Lama, there's a Dalai Lama quote about that. What does he say? He's saying, what you perceive about yourself is the size of your, uh, you know, pinky. small, yeah, yeah. pinky, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, but there's still, I'm still uncertain what you're saying here. So let's try to nail it down. Yes. Um, so are you saying that like if visitors from outer space were to come to our planet in 200 years or something, they would find the whole place deserted. They wouldn't find any physical life here anymore. And that everyone, all the souls here now would have moved on to some other realm. Um, yes and no. <laughs> Let me clarify. Um, this current iteration of human existence required a certain type of ecosystem to be in place to provide the human experience to flourish and to have the human body as well as the nature that we need in order to have everything that we need provided for us. Right. right? The perfect conditions. It's almost like unimaginable. It's random. That's also what a lot of scientists say. It's like, it's, too good to be true. I don't know if it's random, but I will leave that point. But <laughs> I yes. think I think there's an intelligence running the universe that doesn't do anything randomly. But go on. Exactly. So thank you for that. So um, there is that part where these conditions were established for a specific moment in time, for a specific period in time, for human consciousness to come to some level of ripening, so it can move to another plane of existence. Now, what will happen to Earth afterwards? Earth will become home to a new form of consciousness. An entire new ecosystem will develop itself and a new consciousness will develop from that. That is the perspective that is shared with me. Now, how much does it matter and how much of it is information for entertainment I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, let me press you a little bit more. I mean, we're in the sixth mass extinction, they say. There have been five others. I think the previous one was the Permian mass extinction. And I saw an article just, the, just yesterday, I think, that said that the methane release in the Arctic is now accelerating so fast that, um, you know, some scientists feel like, you know, there may be no significant life forms left on Earth within half a decade because methane is 80 times more potent than CO2. And, you know, there's just going to be so much of it that the Earth will... I mean, if the Earth heats six degrees, uh, we're all we're all toast. Um, so are you sort of saying that maybe we're in for some kind of mass extinction like that and that, you know, over a long lapse of time, everything will regrow and the... the the planet will become hospitable again for a new um, proliferation of life? In, in a short, if I were to answer this in a short way, I would say yes. That is uh, what I'm being shared. Now, is this dire or depressing? No. Not necessarily. <laughs> Not necessarily. Like if I look at it from a... Um, um, Yes, I love this earth and I love this human experience and we all love it in all the things that it provides for us. Will it be forever? No, it will not be forever because nothing is really forever so far as we have seen. <laughs> and in this, um, so there will be some sort of completion, the completion of this human material experience. And after that completion, the earth will provide the, to be the home for a new form of consciousness Yeah, that can go through a similar experience as we have. Huh. Well, as Woody Allen said, I don't mind dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, he will be there when he dies. <laughs> yeah, right. um, yeah. So, I mean, have they given you any kind of timeline? Um, between 50 to 100 years. Uh-huh. So some of us will probably be there. Yeah. All right. Well, now, it's it's really hard to imagine, like considering what has transpired this year that we couldn't have even imagined in our wildest dreams. Um, 
what is possible within 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Oh, yeah. They, yeah, you can never. I mean, back in the 90s, there was hardly any internet. It was just this real fledgling thing. And, and look at how it's changed the world. Yeah, totally. We are an ever-changing and incredibly fast-paced change that we're experiencing. Yeah. So what I'm being what I'm being shared with is that now the evolution of our consciousness is even more important than ever. The evolution as individuals, the spiritual evolution, but in a net more maybe more understandable way, the self-realization of the individual is more important than ever. Yeah, here's a quote from your book. You say, you will see that the journey to self-realization will be accelerated almost to the detriment of those who are not yet on this journey. It will be difficult um, for those to experience the higher levels of energies coming through this plane. When Mm -hmm. utilized correctly, it can lift you up towards the self-realization point When resisted, it will bring pain and potentially suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a really good quote. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's like if there is a lot of fuel, let's let's say everything that is energy is a form of fuel. Right? If we learn and understand to ride these waves of energy that can uplift us, then we are propelled to higher states of consciousness. If we resist it, and then the energy becomes like, almost like you're resisting a big wave that's coming. Like you can't resist the wave. Ask any surfer, right? Yeah, I was just thinking (laughs) of surfing, you know? Yes. And if I go to the beach in Hawaii and I see 30-foot waves... Yeah. I'm going to say, uh, I'm not going in the water, but uh, an ex, uh, you know, a skilled surfer will say, oh, this is a great day. I'm going out there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But you'll also see how they interact and how they relate to the waves because they have learned to ride them, li- to, to, ride them to go underneath them when the timing is, is also about timing. They're utilizing the energy of the wave to ride the wave. Yeah. So what you're saying is that there's an evolutionary wave sleeping, sweeping the planet and Correct. that if, and that we can ride it if we want to. Um, yes. And perhaps you can elaborate. I mean, obviously all the different types of spiritual practices that one can do and putting one's attention on this kind of stuff, those are ways of riding it. And Absolutely. those who, why don't you elaborate on that and also elaborate a little bit on how it is one would resist riding it. Yeah. And the consequences that might accrue from that. When this year the pandemic started, um, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of our existing comforts were taken away or are being taken away. What we used to rely on to feel safe is potentially no longer there or is being reduced. When our environment changes, our comforts are being taken away. There's something that comes up. It's a survivalistic need, right? So how do we deal with challenges that are indeed threatening our comfort, how is threatening our survival? How are we present in the moment of the challenge? How do we react as a human being? Do we take it? Do we observe it? Do we learn from it? Are we present, like fully present with what is in front of us? Or are we resisting, running, screaming, you know, breaking things or blaming other people? You know, how do we deal with this is because the challenge is just the challenge, right? And so what the guys that I work with, they're saying is, you will learn to ride the waves by facing the challenges with a deeper sense of presence and a deeper sense of peace. And that deeper sense of peace comes from inside. No one can give it to you from outside. And that to me has been like the the biggest one to embody as well as to deliver. 
Like, let's work on what is inside of you that is not holding you in a place of peace where you can face any challenge that is coming your way. If it's a pandemic today, if it's an earthquake tomorrow, if it's a fire the other day. Yeah. One other point to throw in here is that, you know, my feeling is that, um, I don't know if it coincided perfectly with the, with the arrival of the pandemic, but maybe it did, is that it was as if a rheostat was being turned up, you know, in terms of the amount of voltage or the amount of energy in the field. And I noticed I started dreaming much more vividly and meditations became kind of more profound. And, and also it was, um, and I, this is something I, many people have felt was going to happen for, you know, decades. We've been thinking that something like this might come, but um, so I mean, I'm just using myself as a case in point. Many, many people listening to this can probably agree that it wasn't a big surprise, and it, you know, almost it was like, oh boy, you know, finally this thing is is starting to to happen, um, and. It, it, it's kind of an opportunity. Um, now, obviously, there are lots of disruptions to one to various lifestyles. Mine didn't change much just to, because of the way I live my life, but um, it can be very dis- disruptive for many people with jobs in jeopardy and kids unable to go to school and all that. But um, I don't mean to trivialize that, but there's definitely something happening in terms of world consciousness or collective consciousness that is exciting if you sort of see it in the right perspective and and is a, is a great opportunity for advancement and i'm sorry to talk so long but i just want to get that absolutely. thought out i absolutely agree with you and we've faced different uh, forms of challenges as a human society and as individuals continuously we face challenges that's almost like it's part of the human experience without the challenge there is very little growth. And in nature, everything is being challenged, right? Like life in nature is continuously being challenged, which pushes for evolution. It pushes for growth. And here is where the message is, is rather than suffering in front of the challenge, learn to evolve, learn to be present to what is happening. Yeah. I think we can't emphasize that point too often, too many times. Mm. Um, I wonder if if people listening to this have a question about this. I'd be interested in hearing what people are thinking. Um, Of course. You know, do you you concur with what we're saying? Can you relate to it? Or do you feel like we're being a little bit um, insensitive, you know, to to people's circumstances? Um, Have you had experiences in your own lives uh, that kind of help to... um, verify what we're saying in terms of the uh, quickening of, of your evolution. It'd be interesting to hear what, what people might say. <clears throat> okay, so I have a lot of points in front of me and w- that we can go into, but is there anything on your mind right now that you feel like would be a good segue that we should um, shift into in our discussion? I think we can just continue with your points. Okay, good. I'm enjoying this. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Um, so... We understand pretty much what you do in terms of, uh, and it's towards the end of this interview, we're going to have you do a channeling thing and has to kind of demonstrate it. And you, before we do that, you can uh, tell us, you know, whether you want people to ask questions or how, the, how it's going to work. Um, all right. So one major um, phase of your activity and feel free to explain other phases, but then you go around to uh, different sacred sites in the world. And you serve as some kind of a catalyst or something at those sacred sites. And there, you have YouTube videos on your channel of yourself going to Jerusalem or Turkey or looks like Thailand or something. Um, so explain how that works and what the guides or, um, you know, tasked you with doing, what they asked you to do in that regard. Mm-hmm. So... There are certain places around the world that are almost like nodes or acupuncture points of the world. If we would consider that the earth is a living organism, has its own energy lines, 
almost like veins of energy that are moving through the earth. Mm, at some places, these energy lines cross. And these nodes are very potent places. Humanity has recognized that and has built sacred places, temples and churches and mosques and on top of these spots. And then um, they serve almost like pillars that hold a certain energy, that hold a certain frequency in that region. Now, some of these places are um, very well known to humanity. It's like the sacred sites, uh, places of pilgrimage and places where important spiritual events have happened. And other places are known to humanity as places where um, big trauma has happened. So you mean I, like uh, Auschwitz or some place like that? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like uh, war zones or you know concentration camps and things like that. And sometimes when trauma happens, the energy that is released uh, doesn't necessarily automatically or easily move. It requires time to digest and to be processed. It requires sometimes, um, um, you know, an acupuncturist to do its work to move that energy. And it seems that the guides that I work with can do that work through me when I'm at these places. So they will tell me, we need you to go to specific places around the world, and we will tell you which specific sites in these countries you need to go to. So last year, I spent most of my time uh, traveling in the Middle East. And so I've went to some of the most sacred places in the Middle East, uh, sacred to humanity or sacred to the locals that are living there, as well as to places where I inquired, uh, where was a disruption of energy, a disruption of the field. And those are places where, um, you know, tragedies happened and where uh, a lot of people died or where there was um, chaos and destruction and that destructive energy hasn't fully cleared. And it seems like that's an important part of our collective evolution to take care of these places. I had a teacher who used to say that prisons were very tough knots of stress like that in the collective consciousness. And here in the US, US, we have over 2 million people incarcerated. And if you've ever gone into a prison, the feeling in there is like, Ugh, you know, it's just a really yeah. in intense, heavy feeling. It's interesting uh, to bring that up. I've, yeah, go ahead. I have been, uh, um, I have been imprisoned in the Middle East because of the work that I do. You mean you were, you were thrown in prison yourself? Yes, uh -huh. I was. And it was, um, <laughs> it was at the end of last year, and it was quite a traumatic experience. Um, here am I thinking, you know, I'm doing good work, helping humanity, and uh, some people don't think that way. Uh, they think I'm, you know, some, some sorcerer yeah. that is doing some evil work. And, um, um, yeah, it was uh, perceived to be a threat. And I was perceived to be a threat to society and its values or their values, particularly. And uh, I was lucky to get out within like 10 days, but it was uh, a time frame that could have been years. Yeah. Um, well, I guess uh, two questions. One is, you know, do you feel that as you went to these sacred sites, you made a significant difference? And how did you perceive or measure that difference? I'll just ask yeah. that first, and then I have another question after that. So I perceive that when I go to some of these places, there is a shift in energy that happens once the work is complete. And the work that happens in those places is almost like a realignment. It's almost like a cleansing uh, it's almost like a reconnection 
to other places in the world as well as to higher uh, dimensions is almost like, oh, we are reactivating this place. It's been dormant for too long. It was once active and people took care of it, but now it wasn't anymore. And now it needs to be reactivated. And I do feel a shift in the energy when I'm at these places. Sometimes there is even like, you know, uh, maybe coincidental, but uh, <laughs> too, too many times too coincidental. There's interesting weather phenomena that happen when the work completes. And that would be torrential rain or even like hail. Um, there could be, you know, um, or interesting political events that happen once I leave, like in, shortly after I leave. And it could be just divine timing, but it could be related to the work that I do. I'm not 100% sure. The people that come with me to some of these sacred sites, they also feel like deeply tuned in to what is happening there. And they could feel when we start the work that potentially there is a heaviness about the place, a heaviness that is visceral, that is that can be described and felt. And once we finish it, there is a more lightness to the place that they can also feel. And that's when we feel complete and we move on to the next place. It's <laughs> like continuous one thing after another thing. And at times, um, I think I mentioned to you earlier, I did 11 countries last year with 140 sacred sites. And uh, that was a lot of places to be visited. What the guides say is when this work is done, um, that entire region gets almost an uplift in its frequency. An uplift that provides the fertile soil for spiritual transformation. Now, the individuals that are receiving the benefit, they don't really have to know what is causing the, the benefit itself, but there is a benefit to it when you know people go to a mass grave or a place of genocide to clear those energies. It is an important task that used to be a lot more valued in the past. <laughs> And now there is a handful of people that are still doing this. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I've interviewed a couple of people who do that kind of thing. Cynthia Jewers, um, I don't know if you know of her, but she was given this task by these Tibetan masters of taking these sacred jars and kind of doing all kinds of blessings on them and stuff and then burying them in certain sacred sites around the year, around the world. And she's been doing that. Um, and uh, another fellow, I forget his name. What's that guy's name who... Yeah, it'll come to me. Maybe Dan can look it up. The, the, that fellow who um, works between Germany and, and Israel to, to minimize tensions uh, in the collective consciousness. I've interviewed him a couple of times. Um, yeah, but there are a number of people who sort of recognize this principle of collective consciousness being like a sponge of some kind that <clears throat> soaks up stress or tension um, and that it has to be relieved. Otherwise, the whole humanity is dragged down. And also, I think we could say that if, the, if this, well, let's switch metaphors to clouds with static electricity in them, if it builds up to a sufficient degree, then lightning strikes out. And, you know, correspondingly, if, if the stress in collective consciousness becomes sufficiently saturated, wars can break out, you know, and other extreme things that are, you know, much less uh, humane way of resolving that stress than the kind of thing you're doing, obviously, which is to just really dissolve it from a deep level. I think no one has ever described it as well as you just did. <laughs> I'm sure they have. Thank you. I stand I on the shoulders you. of giants. <laughs> um, but another thought that came to me as you were speaking was, again, um, this is sort of related, but you know, think how much stress there is in prisons, for instance, we use that example, or in the inner cities of some places, or in countries that are like Syria, where we're going through all this terrible strife. It's just, and you go into an atmosphere like that, and you can just, it hits you like a ton of bricks, you can just really feel it. And, you know, one could um, despair of being able to make a significant difference in that just because it's so big, it's so heavy, and who are, you know, little old 
us to actually have make a big difference. But what you're doing, I believe, is like, you know, well, I, I mentioned, I referred to you as a catalyst. A catalyst is something that, you know, is a small thing that changes a chemical reaction um, without its, well, how, you can probably explain it better. You're the scientist. But it's a, it, it can make a big difference. It's like it has a leverage on, on the outcome of a chemical reaction. And so if you can work at a deeper level, you can have influences at all the more superficial levels much more effectively than if you try to work at the superficial levels. Yes. And, and both, and both uh, access points are valid. Um, you know, on the superficial level as well as on the deeper levels, which is, I believe, why the guides want me to do both, like working on individuals directly as well as on the land. Yeah. So different access points. What's interesting is, like you mentioned, Syria. I, I went last year to Syria as well as to Iraq. And uh, it's very difficult to get into a war zone if you're a civilian and <laughs> uh, an active or, you know, uh, still active place. And, and I went there and I did meet with some healers as well as people that have been consciously choosing to stay in those places to provide a certain level of light, uh, to provide hope, to provide healing. And when, they, when I arrived and they found out about that, the fact that I was there to help, to support, they traveled for hours and hours to a war and torn country to see me and to receive support. It was like the most touching thing I've had ever experienced. Like being in a country where individuals have consciously chosen to stay because they knew they were needed there more than ever. Mm. Yeah, I, um, I did a kind of a similar thing back in the 70s. I was in the TM movement and we had this project where we went to the most troubled troubled ridden places in the world. I, I spent three months in Iran, um, you know, doing meditating most of the day in a large group of people and, um, and other groups went to, you know, the Middle East and, um, South, South Africa where the apartheid situation was really intense and the, you know, Central America, Nicaragua, things were stirring up. And, you know, some sociologists did a lot of research on various measurable trends such as, you know, war deaths and crime rate and other things and economic indicators. And they did find that there was a correlation between our presence there and these indicators. I'm familiar with that study. Yeah. It's incredible to see that that's possible and it's measurable and it does have an impact yeah. on the people that live there. Incidentally, the person whose name I was trying to remember a few minutes ago, Thomas Hubel, he does this oh, thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Slipping my mind. Um, and what you said just now about, you know, you not only work on the specific sacred sites and, and the different physical geographic spots, but you also work on individuals. And obviously that is just as important, if not more so, because these individuals are like, you know, all of us are like nodes in a big network. And each little node is having a ripple effect throughout the entire network. So you have to enliven as many nodes as possible, too. That's exactly right. And initially I thought, well, what can a single person like me uh, you know, do in this grand world of billions of people? And how long is it going to take for me to, to complete that work? It's just, how is that going to work? And eventually the guide started to share that more people, more individuals will have to be developed to become pillars of light. That's literally the term that they used, pillars of light. And They've delivered um, a form of training course to get people through the processes that I have gone through. Not exactly the same thing because not everyone has to do what I'm doing, but to get them to a place where they become pillars of light and whatever they choose to do is delivered with a particular energy, is delivered with a particular frequency and the light. Hmm. There's a couple of principles um, that are interesting here. One is in the heart, 1% of the cells are called pacemaker cells, and they have to fire coherently. And when they do so, they 
the, the other 99% of the cells in train with them and the whole heart beats, you know, with a proper rhythm. And um, in a laser, the square root of 1% of the photons in the laser have to align with one another coherently. And when they do, the rest of the photons in train with them and you get like one coherent beam of light, a laser. So this obviously has a relevance to what we're talking about with individuals and the rest of humanity. Absolutely. I do see an incredible uh, ripple effect. I do see a multiplier effect through impacting one individual that is touching many other individuals, as well as the, um, the way it is unconsciously delivered, the way you just mentioned. It's like, oh, you are doing the work, but it has a lot more effect than we can fathom, we yeah. can measure, we can fully understand. But there is an effect, right? The way you have described the transcendental meditations. Well, like you were saying, the, quoting the Dalai Lama, you know, I mean, what we know of ourselves is just the, our little tip of our pinky. There's, there's so much more. And, you know, by doing this deeper work, it's that, that so much more that is actually, you know, f- fanning out and, and permeating the collective consciousness. And so, um, and, and, you know, creating a shift at a deep level. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Irene says I'm talking too much. <laughs> I like you talking, Rick. <laughs> That's her job. Just to, one of them. One of them. <laughs> um, all right. I think we've covered that point pretty well. So um, let's cover some of the kind of more human stuff. Um, I mean, you know, people are concerned about health and uh you know both mental and physical and you know facing various challenges and difficulties in life and relationships and and that kind of stuff um uh and so what kind of i know that a large portion of your book is dedicated to addressing those concerns and it consists primarily of transcripts of actual channeled sessions that you've done on various topics, usually in response to questions people have asked. But um, are there any, just what comes to mind when I mention those topics? What would you like to tell people about some of those things? I'd say that we are in this human experience and we have various forms of misalignments. And I find perfection in the imperfection of the human experience. So there is some beauty to it. And if we dedicate ourselves to finding a more alignment in our mental constructs, finding more alignment in our emotional and as well as in our physical constructs, then we're able to reach even higher states of consciousness. We're able to reach Um, altered states of consciousness where we can tap into the innate power of this human form and a deeper connection to earth. So in both directions, right? And as we are more aligned, we can receive more. And the energy that flows between, um, let's say, the universe through the earth can flow through us because we are conduits in in the midst of that, right? So the more we are aligned, the better that energy flows. And that increases our quality of life. That increases our peace within. That increases our presence within. And that allows for self-healing capabilities to re-arise and that allows for better relationships and that allows for better conscious decisions to be made. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, Before we started, I asked you if you were married and you said no, but you were just sort of coming out of a relationship and that the breakup has been kind of difficult for you. And um, so... I don't know, people, and you said I could ask you about this, but people might wonder, well, geez, you know, if this guy is having such profound experiences and he's talking to the ascended masters and all, if he can't, like, manage to get a relationship right, what hope is there for the rest of us? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So, um, let's see. Um, 
And I should let you off the hook a little bit in saying that maybe not all relationships are meant to last, um, just as yeah. not all relationships with a guru are meant to last. Some gurus are like transitional teachers and we might move on to a different one. And it, it, we've, we've learned what we need to learn with this one. And maybe now it's time to, you know, learn something new with somebody else. Thank you for that. Thank you. It's, um, it's really interesting in, in this human experience, we do a lot of things in order to, um, develop in order to grow. So it could be like we grow our mental capacity or we grow our physical body and um, by exercising. And some individuals have done a lot of relational work in order to grow their emotional capacity. And in my personal uh, journey, I have done a lot of the spiritual work. I've done a lot of the mental work. And the emotional part had been um, a bit let's say, lagging behind, right? So in this relationship, I've discovered in all the ways that, that I had parts of me that weren't fully taken care of yet. I think the relationship is an incredibly strong mirror to look at all those parts within. Right? And you may have the most perfect and the most amazing partner, and most likely that partner is the one that triggers you the most. <laughs> that just gets to the places that are still slightly out of alignment, right? And so this has been uh, a bit of my journey where I thought, okay, spiritual development alone is cannot be done in a silo. It cannot be done um, in isolation. There is a holistic way of growth that we as a human being have to go through. That includes the human heart. That includes the emotional heart. And that is, how do I relate to myself? How do I relate to others? And in which ways have I carried the wounds of many, many generations before me into this very moment? And how do I carry, to some degree, a responsibility to transform the wounds of the many generations before me, right? Yeah. So that is a bit like uh, the, the journey that I've been going through. And like, okay, what am I resisting uh, in this relationship? And where do I need to take responsibility? And where can I learn? Where can I grow? And as you said, some relationships are meant to last for a period of time or to bring a specific uh, knowledge to us, a specific piece of wisdom, and then we continue. Yeah, and that, of course, is not to say that as soon as the going gets rough, you th you should one should say, "All right, well, this one isn't meant to last. I'm moving on," because <laughs> then you become a dilettante. You know, you never go deep. You're just always hopping from one thing to another, chasing the chasing the romance phase, you know, the rush of that, and it's not really fascinating because I've. I've uh, a couple times in this relationship, particularly, I have tried to, um, I was like, okay, I'm done. This is just, you know, this is too much. I have more important things to do. Yeah, you know, more important things to do. And I'll just do something else. And luckily, I'm, I'm very lucky that I have the guides in, in that sense. And they would say, no, you're not finished yet with this relationship. Uh -huh. Yeah deeper in, there is an important learning for you to get. And you can only get this in the full surrender to another human being, in the full surrendering of your heart, not even to them. What is really interesting, because they say there is a specific design between two human beings that is almost greater, greater than our connection to the universe. Hmm, interesting. Did they elaborate on that point? There is a part that we can truly only fully explore and learn from in relationship to another human being, a type of love that will be displayed in this human experience with another human being. Yeah. And it cannot be replaced or compensated by a spiritual connection that we have. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, just as your spiritual connection isn't going to take the place of food or exercise or anything else there, you know, certain things you can only get through 
the human experience. One point that I often mention in interviews is that um, I'm always very reluctant to use the word enlightenment because it has this sort of static, superlative connotation. But if I were to use it at all, I would want to reserve it for a state which was very holistically developed. In other words, not that you had this super consciousness, but you were sort of a schmuck in terms of your you know, behavior, but rather that you know, consciousness fully developed, senses fully refined, emotions fully blossomed, you know, just sort of ethical behavior, very ethically clean, just all the various facets of intellect, very sharp, you know, just all the different facets of our being fully enriched. And I think that that, that term, if we're going to use it at all, should ought to be reserved for a state like that, which is very rare from compared with just this awakening or that awakening that people say they have. It's very well said. I, I do truly believe in the holistic way of being. And I also believe in the, the level and the depth of presence that one can display in the moment. Mm -hmm. Right? In whichever way I'm not present, there is still a bit of work to do. Absolutely, yeah. There is still a bit more alignment to do. Yeah. And if you're still breathing, chances are there's still work to do. <laughs> I agree. I do. <laughs> yeah, we're all works in progress. <clears throat> um, one thought that occurred to me as you were speaking a minute ago is that I bet you that just about everybody is channeling some guide uh, at times, but you know most people don't realize it. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I feel that way in my own life. I don't, I don't have any conscious communication with guides the way you do, but I often feel guided and I feel like it's bigger than my intelligence that's, you know, nudging me this way and that. Uh, and I have friends who claim to be able to see these, you know, subtle guides and all just hovering around people, sort of influencing them in some way. So, I don't know, you want to you wanna comment on that point? So, um, in this in this uh, term of trans-channeling, there is a lot of ways we can channel intelligence that's beyond the, the conscious aware mind. And one of the first steps is actually channeling one's own intuition. And channeling one's innate uh, higher self. Channeling maybe an innate intelligence or guidance of the universe or of the earth. Right? There's multiple layers of non-material consciousness that we can actually channel more into our being and existence. That doesn't have to be a guide and guides that we work with and speak with just the way I do. But there is multiple different ways of doing that. And they're all equally powerful and equally valid. So that's why I say, I have a specific role to play, but not everyone is going to have to play that role. There's many ways of guidance. You know, another point that would be good to bring in is that um, if we look at Vedanta and some of the more ultimate teachings of spirituality, they say that we are the totality. We are Brahman. That's what we are. And, so, and that alone is. And so we are the vast wholeness that contains everything. And therefore, you know, contains universes and therefore contains guides and archangels and whomsoever they may be. And um, so in a sense, you know, you're not interacting with something external to yourself. In the highest sense, this whole everything that everybody experiences, you included with your channeling procedure, is something that's happening within yourself, self with a capital S. Mm -hmm. It's well said. And um, I can totally see that perspective. I don't know how much of a difference it makes in the work that I do. Um, it may be that the work that I do change will change and will transform. And I can see that there is a greater intelligence um, that could very well be part of who I am and what I am. That there's one thing that um, 
the guides have shared, which is that we are all part of the same fabric, which they consider to be grand consciousness. And grand consciousness itself does not carry consciousness. It's the dissolution of consciousness. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, in the sense of that grand consciousness itself is not aware of its own existence. Mm. It's the dissolution of existence. It is the dissolution of self-awareness. Able to be holding all of consciousness, including our specialized human experience and the angels and the archangels and so on. Uh -huh. So to become aware of its own existence, it needs to diversify, right? Correct. Yeah. Exactly. And so we are it being aware of its own existence. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. In fact, some people sort of go through this cosmology of how the universe emerges in the first place that you know the sort of primordial field of being uh, is consciousness but it's not conscious but then the but it becomes conscious it becomes conscious and the only, the only thing for it to be conscious of is itself because it's the only thing down there and so then when it becomes conscious of itself then this sort of whole diversity begins to spring up and get more and more and more elaborated and the whole universe unfolds <laughs> it's interesting yeah yeah it's really a fascinating place to be going to um and it becomes harder and harder to put into words the further out you go as yeah. you know <laughs> it becomes incomprehensible inexpressible and uh, language almost doesn't do it justice yeah it's true but it's fun to play around with it totally is fun to play around <laughs> and <laughs> kind of stretches you to try to love I love people to have personal, direct, spiritual experiences. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's ultimately all about. We can, you know, you can starve to death reading a restaurant menu. You have to eat the food. <laughs> well said. Well said. <laughs> Here's a question that came in from Dan in London. Um, you know, we were sort of a little apocalyptic earlier in our conversation, um, like we're all going to you know, be leaving this planet. And Dan asks, will spiritual truths ever be known and accepted in the mainstream by the majority of people on the planet? Will this ever happen while we are still here? I think it will inevitably be happening. Um, the reason I say that is if we are challenged strong enough, we will look for answers in places that we haven't looked before. We will try to consider other perspectives. We will try to consider the totality of humanity's perspectives, not just a singular direction that we have been following. And that will include the spiritual perspective as an important element of making sense of what we are experiencing, of making sense of our reality. So I do perceive that part of what Dan is asking about will come. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. As, as long as you think you have it all figured out, you don't look for answers. But, you know, when, when the things you think you knew fall short of satisfactory, you know, when they just don't provide the solutions you'd hoped for, then you have to dig deeper. And I think we're, we're experiencing that in a collective way right now. Absolutely. Yeah. So you wanted to do a, a kind of a channeling thing during this interview, and um, I don't know exactly how you're going to do that, but let's do it. Um, one thing to note if people haven't seen you do this before is that you you do a lot of mudras and movements and stuff while you're doing it. And um, so just so people understand, maybe you, maybe you should explain exactly what you're going to do and what people will see. I can. I can. So yeah. basically... Um, in the beginning, there is, um, there is some shaking in my body that happens through convulsions in my lower belly. And there are some important energy centers that are basically building up energy. It's almost like an engine that's starting. I'm not having an epileptic seizure, but it's really just like, uh, it's like the, the warm up of my body, like building up, building up, building up. 
and for this energy to circulate in my system, like my body will just make these almost circular movements. And eventually the energy will build up enough and strong enough for the embodiment to happen. It's almost like they require my vessel to be in a certain state before they embody. Right? It's like, um, you know, the race car driver will only get in the car if it's like perfectly warmed up and if it's perfectly uh, maintained and so on. So that's in some ways I perceive myself like a race car, as odd as it sounds. So I have to do a lot for maintenance. I have to do a lot for warm up and so on and so forth. And when it's well tuned, it'll go very well. And that's what I've been witnessing. So there is some shaking and there is some mudras and eventually my body will sink down and then it will be coming back up. That's when the embodiment has happened. And that's when uh, the embodied being will speak. Good. All right. So you don't need any questions or anything. You'll just come out with whatever you come out with. Yeah, let's do that. And uh, at times, sometimes, they will offer for questions. So if you have something that you'd like to know, uh, you know. Maybe I'll have something based on what you say. And otherwise, maybe people will send in a question. But if they're going to send in a question, they should send it in quickly because otherwise, if there's a big delay, you might be finished by the time we get the question. Yeah, possibly. Or you'll just come up with whatever comes to you, right? <laughs> um, so I'll say also like that, that this spoken channeling is one part of it. The other part is, uh, which we're not going to do here today, but that we do in my transmissions on a regular basis, is an energetic transfer. It's an alignment that they provide for, uh, you know, the mental, the emotional, the physical, as well as the energetic body. And that is delivered to sometimes, you know, hundreds or thousands of people at a time uh, when this work is being done. Do you do those so, like online as well as in, in person? Um, in person, not so much anymore lately. Oh, uh, yeah. We used to. Um, now everything has moved online and it is, according to the reports, as effective as the, the in-person sessions. And it allows people to do it from their meditation room, right? Comfort of their meditation rooms. So we'll do the spoken channeling part, but even in that place, people will feel some sort of energetic shift. Or at least I invite you to observe if that is arising for you. (laughs) Should people keep their eyes open, close their eyes, or what? Whichever you like. Um, For some people, it is easier to go into a meditative state when they close their eyes. And for some people, it is uh, more interesting to watch. (laughs) which I can totally relate to.
Greetings. My name is Emmanuel. As you have come to this gathering, you seek answers that are within you. Your existence in human form has separated you from all of existence for a moment. To have this temporary experience, to witness separation, to witness individuality, to witness the spectrum of human experience, the spectrum of this material reality, the spectrum of emotions individualized through you. In your human experience, you become the extension of the human collective, an experiment conducted through you. Learnings derived through your experiences, realizations driven by your search of truth. The separation and reconnection to all of existence will happen in continuous cycles. The immediate cycle that you experience is the entirety of a lifetime. Bigger cycles is the creation of entire forms of consciousness and the dissolution and integration of this formed consciousness into other levels, other forms of consciousness of greater kind. All of consciousness lives and exists within what we consider the grand consciousness of existence. You are part of this and your existence in itself is unique. Your experience in this totality of existence is unique. Your learnings and realizations are unique. Therefore, all of your experiences are valid and true. In your perspectives, your judgments and your emotions are equally valid and true. Your unique perspective cannot be recreated. It is momentary only through you. Yet in this formulation of your perspective, in this formulation of your reality, you learn, you grow, and you evolve, as well as all of human consciousness does. Everything that you perceive, everything that you realize, returns to the collective. And it becomes your service to the collective. It becomes your service to yourself. Your dedication for growth. Your request for answers. Your continuous search and innate desire to self-realize is intrinsic to you, intrinsic to the human experience. And in this growth process, you move closer to self-realization. One of the primary objectives in the human experience, the self-realization of the individual, your journey, 
unique to you, yet innately driving your evolution, innately driving the evolution and the expansion of consciousness. Thank you for choosing to be on this journey. Thank you for receiving the support that is provided to you by other human beings, by other beings of non-material kind, by forms of consciousness that are in support of your existence. Creative as well as destructive forces, all of which serve this existence that you are currently in. Learn from everything that is within your reality. Even the experiences that you judge to be difficult, to be bad, to be challenging to your core, are experiences to be cherished, are experiences to be learned from. The beauty of human experience, the beauty of the human form is a gift to you. It is a gift to your soul that has chosen the human experience as a valid form of learning, growth and evolution. While the human collective will learn, your soul will learn as well in the process of your human experience. Thank you for listening to my words. I will now answer some of your questions. Um, there's a machine operating outside, so we're going to hear a little background noise. But um, first, an individual question from Riza in Portland, Oregon. She asks, I'm wondering what the guides counsel in terms of health. I have been having a challenge for several months and have tried various practitioners. Now I am focusing on meditation and prayer for guidance. In the human form, every single human being will experience misalignments of sorts. These misalignments are part of the journey of learning to understand this vessel that you have been gifted. Some of these misalignments are part of the experiments of evolution conducted through each individual, every new being that is entering this plane. These misalignments of the physical form have answers to be realigned. Some of the answers are within your conscious awareness as a human collective. Some of these answers can be delivered in support of realignment and healing. Some of the answers require deeper contemplation, deeper reflection, and an alignment of the other parts of your being, the mental, the emotional, as well as the energetic body have an immediate and direct impact on the physical manifestation of your form. Healing therefore happens on multiple layers of your existence. A holistic approach is therefore more likely to bring the answers that you seek for the alignment that is required. It is not either or, but it is all of the approaches that are provided to you. A combination, a complementary experience 
to feed and to provide everything that this vessel of yours requires, desires, and innately knows to need. In moments of silence of your mind and of your heart, you will hear the innate needs of this body. You will hear the innate needs of the heart and of this energetic spiritual construct that is within you. And you will follow that which arises within you Put aside the doubts and the fears, the worries and the concerns that you hold about the directions that are provided to you. Embrace and try. Let the methods that you try impact you fully and receive as you deserve to receive. Thank you for your question. What else can I answer for you? Um, you spoke, this is from me, um, you spoke of um, the individual and the collective, and I get the sense you're saying that the individual is like a sense organ of, of the collective, like a you know, sense organ of the infinite. Um, St. Teresa of Avila said that it appears that God himself is on the journey, and um, Another friend of mine, a friend of mine, Tim Freak in, in the UK, is always saying these days that God is growing or God, God is evolving um, and that we, that's what the universe is, is that the entirety of God becoming more than he was at the outset of creation. So I know it's a bit of a philosophical question, but I'm wondering if you concur with those perspectives and that we are just participants in the evolution of, of God himself in this whole process of, of creation. You are indeed the participant, and yet you're also the centerpiece of this evolution, of this experience of realization. Your realization truly carries the highest priority, the highest importance to the realization of the collective. The collective cannot realize without you. Therefore, you are more than just a participant. You are the one to drive the realization of the collective. You are the one that truly can make the difference. While not every single individual requires to realize as many individuals that seek this journey and follow the self-realization path, the entire human collective will be impacted in a way that all individuals will receive the benefit of the realizations of everyone. As a soul container that has chosen the human experience, your soul as well improves and evolves in the human experience that you have chosen to have. Through the evolution and the realization of the human collective, all forms of consciousness evolve. Evolution on an individual level has a ripple effect and a connected nature to all of consciousness. You are the representation of all of consciousness in this very moment. Thank you for your question. What else can I? Uh, yeah, Asil mentioned earlier in this conversation that humanity's days seem to be numbered, that maybe in 50 or 100 years there won't be human life on this planet anymore. 
and um, some scientists would concur with that, climatologists in particular. And um, I always think a lot about the world as a whole and humanity as a whole and feel a concern for it and try to do what I can to contribute to its betterment. Um, I'm wondering if what Seal said is like a, a done deal, if, if that's really the way it has to go, or whether there's some wiggle room and if we, if we play our cards right as, as a species, um, we won't, the, the, you know, human life won't be exterminated from the planet. Life on this planet has a timeline. The existence on this plane has a time for completion. A cycle that requires to be completed cannot be avoided. Yet the process for evolution will continue After the completion of this human form, the learnings until the completion of this human experience are still valid and important. Your realizations, your awakening to understanding, the part and responsibility that you play in conjunction and in collaboration with this planet, with the ecosystem, the connection, the love and the compassion with other human beings are still a relevant aspect of your evolution. All efforts towards a balanced, harmonious, peaceful life within yourself and with this planet, with all beings alive on this plane, are efforts worthwhile and critical for the evolution of your consciousness. The survival of the species is an important driving force that is innately embedded within your existence, yet it is not the outcome of the highest benefit. The benefit itself will be the evolution and the maturation of your consciousness, the continuation of your existence, even if it is perceived as unknown and uncertain at this point for you. You will find comfort in knowing and understanding that you as an individualized consciousness will continue to exist and new opportunities, new forms of experiences will be opened up for you. New opportunities to learn. Other forms of connection, other forms of interaction and relation will be formed in this new form of existence beyond this material form that you have inhabited for many generations. It will have served and completed its purpose to bring you to where you are. Thank you for your question. What else can I do for you? Um, perhaps one more question. Um, you mentioned individualized consciousness. Um, when some enlightened beings describe their experience, they can almost hardly be said to have individualized consciousness, someone like Ramana Maharshi. Um, and there's in some, some schools of thought say that when an enlightened being drops the body, they just blend into the ocean of consciousness like a drop into the actual ocean and they no longer exist in any way, shape or form. And yet, um, you know, guides such as yourself seem to be enlightened beings and 
I know actually many people who have had encounters with Ramana Maharshi since he died and others with Jesus or Buddha and, and so on. So my question is, do enlightened beings continue to exist on higher planes? Um, or maybe some do and some actually do merge into the absolute and cease to exist um, in any functional way. An individual human being experiencing enlightenment as a stage of their evolution will continue to exist in all the forms that have experienced individuality in human form. Yet, the increased frequency of their being truly is submerged in all of human consciousness. Their existence and the purpose that they have fulfilled to increase the realization as well as the frequency level of human consciousness is fulfilled. They can choose to continue to exist in non-material form as the individual that they have lived, as any of the individuals that they have lived. They may choose to represent themselves in certain occasions, to provide assistance and support, interventions, and divine presence. It is not a requirement yet. It is a form of service, a continued service of an enlightened being to humanity. The submersion into all of human consciousness in itself is the dissolution of the individualized experiences into all of the experiences ever had. The beauty of the individual itself can and will continue even within the context of the human collective. As you will continue after the completion of this lifetime, all experiences ever had, all emotions and memories ever arisen will be there for you as well as for all of human collective to refer to to re-experience and to witness again. You continue to exist beyond this lifetime. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I think um, no further questions at this time. That's really sweet. We really appreciated um, hearing what you had to say. Thanks, Cecile. Thank you, Rick. Do you feel drained or energized after you do that? Um, there's definitely a, a level of energy that's moving through me. Uh, mm -hmm. I definitely feel altered. So I'm like in half sleep, half awake state. I'm trying to come back into my own body. My own mind, my own thoughts. So it's a really interesting um, experience. It used to be a lot more difficult to return. Um, it was a lot more draining in the past. Sometimes I would channel for 10, 15 minutes and be knocked out for three days. And it changed. As the vessel developed more and more, it became more adept to this switch uh, of on and on. 
I just want to say that um, that seems typical of all kinds of spiritual development where, you know, initially it's like on or off. And then eventually it gets integrated where it's, you know, you can be running through a busy airport and yet in a very profound state of consciousness that originally you could only access in deep meditation or something. Absolutely correct. And in the beginning, it used to take me like 45 minutes or so to just get into that state. <laughs> so I'm, it was I'm glad you moved beyond that stage. <laughs> it was like, yeah, totally. It was like a group of people waiting for me to get like into state. And now it goes really quickly. And in fact, I feel like I have this continuous uh, connection in which I can inquire even when I'm in the supermarket. Yeah, like, yeah. Should I eat this or not? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, but in the sense of like these deeper conversations, um, they want to make sure that the totality of my consciousness isn't flavoring that which is they being delivered. So there's a bit of a distinction when I go into the state, when I deliver the work publicly or, you know, in a group setting, then I take the time to really get into that deep state of. Uh, yeah, that's why you went so much, through so much preparation, even in the early days, you know, when this first began to happen, it was several years before you were able to do anything publicly. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I wonder what you think. I've interviewed a bunch of channelers and there's a bunch I wouldn't want to interview exactly, but um, it, it's a kind of a mixed field in terms of how genuine and prepared a lot of people are, I think. I think there's some genuine ones, but then there's a lot of people who just get into it and who mm. knows exactly what they're saying or on whose behalf. That is absolutely true. And I have to say, before this started on me, I had never read a book of a channeling in my life. I knew they existed, but you know, it was not relevant to me. And um, I can relate to the idea, like especially, for example, if I'm mentally too busy or if I'm emotionally in, you know, uh, stirred up, then the guides will not embody and they will not talk. They say, you have to deal with your human side first before we can work through you. Like, wow, this is how much effort it takes to actually be in a good state in order to be able to deliver the work. Yeah, yeah that and, makes sense. And you are absolutely right that in the different states of trans channeling, which goes all the way from intuition to complete... Um, Imagination. <laughs> yeah completely being unconscious of what's happening as oh, the right. person delivering it, right? So you'll see some like of these Mongolian shamans that don't remember what happened after they have like embodied. So that's like the most extreme. I'd say I'm a bit like a couple, you know, ticks below that extreme. But um, there's many in the spectrum, right? And so depending on where you deliver, sometimes there is flavoring of the ego. There is flavoring of the personal individual. Yeah, that is speaking. Remember what Jesus said about not pouring new wine into old wineskins. Ah, <laughs> that makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. Got to prepare the vessel. Um, and I think that's true not only of channeling, but of the whole spiritual enterprise. I mean, the All whole of thing it. is really about, you know, fine-tuning this instrument so that it can be a fit embody, embodier or reflector of yeah. the vine. And so... In that sense, uh, I try, or we try, as a as a group, as a uh, as a non for profit organization, to deliver this work in its most pure and its most authentic way, and um, and for that we have to make sure that all the circumstances are, are perfect, as perfect as possible, right? It's almost like you're conducting uh, something so sacred that you want to make sure that everyone receives in its, in its utmost um, purity. Yeah, no, I really appreciate and respect that. And um, I was a meditation teacher for many years, and we, were, we had that point drilled into us also uh, in our training, and, you know, that we really have to be a, a, a fit mouthpiece for the teaching and not color it with our individual, mm -hmm. you know. So that's great. Um, 
kind of a quality control thing. <laughs> I wish I wish all teachers had that sort of work ethic. It would prevent a lot of um, heartbreak and confusion. I agree. I agree. And, you know, even in the heartbreak and confusion, lessons are learned. Learnings to be had. And yeah. we are continuously evolving as a species, as individuals as well. And what's interesting is, like, it is, it's putting a really, it's putting a really high bar in terms of integrity for us. And we are on top of that as an organization trying to put an even higher bar for ourselves in terms of integrity, in terms of doing what we say and really meaning what we say and delivering on what we promised and so on and so forth. And and that's a hard walk to walk, you know, or hard talk to walk. <laughs> That's great. I, I helped to found an organization a few years ago called the Association for Spiritual Integrity. I'll send you some information about it. Yes, please. Um, afterwards, you might like to join. It's no big obligation or anything, but um, you'd be a nice person to have involved. Thank you very much, Rick. Oh, you're welcome. For others who are curious, it's just spiritualintegrity.org. You can find it. All righty. So I'm going to just show your website on the screen here. Um, Asiltoxel.org, is it? Dot com. Dot com, .com. Are you disconnected? No, we're wrapping it up. I'm still doing the interview. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're not disconnected. I didn't know we were just chatting. Yeah, no, just uh, okay. So, um, just let's. Uh, why don't you summarize for us um, how people listening to this can plug into your work? So we have, um, on a regular basis. We have donation-based transmissions that happen normally on Saturdays. Then we have all of the past transcripts and all of the sessions that have ever happened uh, live and free, available in archives, on our website, on our YouTube, and so on. And then we are doing various types of courses uh, in order to for example, a course that would go along with the book that allows people to reflect as well as have some life channelings that allows them to go deeper with the book. And then we have the course and the training, uh, which is a three-level course. And the next one starts in January. It is a deeper dive into internal spiritual uh, excavations, you know, from emotional to mental to physical and on this journey, uh, a group of individuals will go through to become a pillar of light. And while there, some of them are already pillars of light, some of them already are in service, they will be even more fine-tuned and even more supported to become even um, more aligned, more pure, more compassionate, more loving in the service that they provide so that they don't feel they're alone in the service that they're providing. Are they trained to do what you do, like channeling, or is there Not necessarily. different things? Different things. So they could be just, they could be healers, or they could be businessmen, they could be uh, parents, but they, to their presence comes a new level of um, depth, a new level of peace, right? So, but I'll say that, that many people that go through our courses uh, develop what we call spiritual gifts that arise when we come into a deeper alignment, certain things will arise. You know that from meditation, right? The more you do that, certain things will start to open up. And that is the same thing that happens with a lot of the people and that join this journey. That's great. Well, thanks so much for all you're doing. And, um, you know, it's wonderful that there are people like you doing this kind of thing. And there, of course, there are all kinds of people around the world as this show attempts to um, highlight. And uh, we're all one big team. And it, it's, you know, I think the world would be in dire straits if, <laughs> if there weren't people doing all this. So, um, you know, I really appreciate the part you're playing. Thank you very much, Rick. And I'll say the same to you and Irene. You guys are doing amazing work and an amazing service to humanity. Thanks. 
Well, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, you know, hope to meet you in person one of these days when people start meeting other people in person again. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully that won't be too far off. Uh, so I really enjoyed my time with you. Thank you very much, Nick. Yeah. And to those who've been listening or watching, uh, you know, this is, as you must know, part of an ongoing series. So, you know, go to batgap.com and check the menus. You'll see what's there. And also, if you wish, um, subscribe on YouTube. We appreciate having more subscribers. So thanks for listening or watching. Uh, next week, I don't have an interview, but I'll be actually playing a uh, recording of a talk that Swami Sarvapiananda gave to that organization that I just mentioned, the organization for the Association for Spiritual Integrity, about the importance of ethics on the spiritual path. So I'll be playing that next week. The following week will be Dean Radin of the Institute of Noetic Sciences and many more to come. So stay tuned. Thanks, Asil. Thank you, Rick. Talk to you later. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.